that between uh, the time of Raja Jain Singh in the late 18th century to around about 1930, my family actually, uh, although we are Bengalis, we lived in uh, Varanasi. And this was a particular, uh, particularly tumultuous period in Indian history, as you know, uh, when we were colonized, uh, not more merely militarily and politically, but we were colonized also in many ways culturally. And my family had, a, had through this period, um, not merely observed this, but actually come to the conclusion that we needed to do two things. One is to begin to revive our own civilization out of the ashes of whatever had happened, but also to modernize it. And so even, even though my family was uh, effectively thrown out of Varanasi in 1930 for having participated in the Kapuri conspiracy case, which many of you will know about. Um, if, when I do visit Varanasi, and I visit it quite often, uh, it's extraordinary that so many artifacts of my family history are still there. Uh, whether it is the Bengali Tola Inter College, set up in 1853 uh, by my family in Madanpura area. It was set up interestingly, the theory why it was set up is also quite interesting. Having observed over the previous couple of generations how um, Indians were simply unable to resist European colonization, as I said, not merely militarily, but also culturally, they came to the conclusion that they needed to create an English medium school. So in 1853, so this is just at the eve of the Great Revolt, uh, they set up a school which still exists to this day in Bengali Tola in the college, and it was the first. English medium school set up by Indians in Northern India and be, that is the reason they set it up but <coughs> subsequently of course they participated various branches of the family participated in various forms in trying to revive and strengthen Indian culture um, so of course there was the revival of yoga which was done by Sri Lahiri Mahashoy or Ramacharan Lahiri who is my great great grand uncle but my own branch of the family got much more involved in the revolutionary movement. So many important events of uh, Indian history took place in my ancestral home, uh, which we, of course, no longer own, uh, but was somewhere in Madhampura, um, including the planning of the Gadar movement, which Raj Bihari Bose and my grand uncle Sachin Ranath Sanyal uh, did in Varanasi. Uh, subsequently, many other events, including, of course, in the end, the planning of Kakuri case, uh, which I think was the straw that broke the camel's back because we were all our homes were expropriated and we were thrown out. And my branch of the family ended up in Allahabad, which is why Chandrasekhar Azad got shot dead coming to our house in Alfred Park in Allahabad, incidentally. But anyway, although we do not have any direct links anymore to, uh, to Varanasi, um, it remains very close to my heart and I do visit it from time to time and I have visited many of the places just mentioned including Vyan Prabha uh, just six months ago. I have many friends there and I continue to explore the city at multiple levels. But quite apart from my own family history, I, there is, I have another reason for being interested in RNC because as Joyla just mentioned, I have a interest beyond my professional life as an economist to explore and understand our civilization and what better place to understand and understand it is this Prayag Varanasi area. I was just there last week in the, the Kumbh uh, to take a dip and here literally as you take a dip there in, in the coming together of the Yamuna and the Ganga and the mythical Saraswati, uh, you literally feel a connect with the primordial past. And Varanasi is important to this because some very recent findings from that region suggest a very different history than what our conventional history today is uh, taught, the narrative that is taught in our uh, uh, usual textbooks. The usual textbook story is that really our civilization started somewhere in northwest India along the banks of the Indus and more recent research suggests also a dry river of the Saraswati. But the conventional story still seems to cling to the view that the Gangetic Plains was either not very heavily inhabited or at least not 
cradle of civilization. It was somewhat outside it and that really civilization got going when the Harappan civilization of the Indus Saraswati area fell apart and people from that area sort of spread in different directions, essentially seeding Indian civilization in various places. Now that part of that did happen. There is no doubt that the, the area northwestern India uh, did, and, and particularly with the collapse of the, the uh, Indus Saraswati civilization, there was indeed a, 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 a that was indeed an important event in Indian history. But recent archaeology suggests that in fact there were already cities of significant size in the Gangetic Plains in the Bronze Age, which were contempor uh, contemporaries to the Harappan cities. And that is quite interesting because just across from um, Triveni, Sangam and Prayag, there is a place called Jusi. And recent archaeology in Jusi suggests that it was already a significant urban settlement in the Bronze Age. Very, very recently, research done uh, uh, by uh, IIT Kharagpur suggests, uh, and they have not archaeology, but these are more uh, geomorphological studies, uh, but they did find uh, remains which suggest human habitation in Varanasi going back, I don't know, five, six thousand years? Yes. So, so this would again take us back to the Bronze Age. And is that the right date? What was your date? 6,000 years? 5,000 years? <laughs> Something in that range? Which is interesting because, of course, Varanasi takes its name from the city between the Varuna and Dasi. Dasi has sadly become a drain, but the Varuna is still at least a uh, visible uh, river. And on, I think somewhere near that Var Varuna uh, Ghat uh, area, you, you well, found. 1800 BC. 1800 BC. BC. So there you go. So therefore, we are talking Varuna about hmm? Varuna Valley. Hmm, Varuna Valley. So in that area and other areas, if in fact some even older findings I think you have. A little older than Ramanagar. Huh. I mean, habitation wise. Yes. So suggest, suggesting that they were already, but unfortunately, these are I think under heavily habited, inhabited areas. So we haven't done archaeology there. But nevertheless, does suggest that there were already significant you have habitations. And Ramanagar, you have. Yeah, Ramnagar as well. So there were significant habitations in this area which were contemporaneous with at least the late Harappan, if not the mature Harappan period. And certainly, of course, we have the Neolithic sites in Belan Valley, which is also not very far. So this general area may actually have been the cradle of another source of our civilization, which in some ways fits with our own understanding, our traditional understanding of our history, which was not entirely only derived from the Saraswati area, but from various sources. And my own sense is that this area of Prayag to uh, Varanasi area was another of the nodes of our civilization, which goes back to the very, very beginning. So in that sense, as we begin to excavate these areas, and we have now uh, begun in certain areas, we have done some digs, uh, I think near Kashi Vishwanath temple also we did a dig. Underneath what I discovered was a badminton court of a local club. Um, the local club was willing to, uh, to suspend badminton games for about one season. So we only managed to dig as far as the Kushan period. No, no, no. Uh, uh, we dug up to natural soil. Uh -huh. It starts from Kushan period. Uh, starts from Kushan period in that area. So there are various uh, sort of spots which have been dug. And we can clearly see that there is serious depth in that. In fact, when you stand at the ghats, you get the impression that Varanasi is on a sort of a hill. But I am getting now the impression that that hill is actually just large amount of debris, of layer upon layer upon layer of our history. So, the, what is interesting about this project is that it then takes all these various aspects of our understanding of our civilization. One is of course taking the more uh, his, history, culture, archaeology kind of approach. But of course, Varanasi is not just something of the past. It is a living city, uh, living in multiple ways. Uh, it is, of course, the constituency of our current Prime Minister. Um, it is home to what I hear is Asia's largest residential university, which is a living uh, uh, center of knowledge and uh, uh, 
far. <coughs> um, and of course, uh, it is, um, uh, in, and I have argued this, um, people may not believe it, but in fact, it is actually a very fascinating urban design, which has enormous implications for how we design modern cities. Um, I keep, uh, you know, current uh, conventional thinking of in India is that, in fact, Chandigarh is the best planned city in India. And I like to often instigate debate by saying, in fact, it is Varanasi, because Varanasi is a true evolving city because it is layer on layer of adjustment and tinkering over centuries that have led to whatever it has ended up. So the lanes and by lanes of Varanasi are not the problem. Uh, and trying to straighten them out is a bad idea. The problem is having cars, which is an artifact of the 20th century and may not exist in the 21st century after a little while. <laughs> so I would argue that studying the, the evolving uh, ecology urban ecology of Varanasi has a lot to teach us about the longer evolution of how cities should be. I mean, we, now if you read the cutting edge thinking on cities, it's all about walkability. And of course, how does it matter if a road is straight or curved or turns at a sudden right angle if you're walking? So from a walking perspective, the logic of Varanasi is perfectly good. It's mixed use, it has large urban spaces which are open to all sections of society. It is continuously evolves, it mixes uh, commerce with art and culture, with history, with modernity in multiple ways. And I would argue that, therefore, Varanasi is an extremely interesting city to study because in a sense it is a microcosm of who we are. With that, let me stop and hand it back to Jagan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Uh, for setting us into a time and space course of the living legend of Varanasi, a crescent, a half moon, lying between the two uh, rivulets, Varuna and Asi, mentioned in many scriptures, you know, like the Brihadaranak Upanishad, Ila Asi, Mitra Varuni, you know, and uh, also mentioned in an indirect way in the Rig Veda, because some of the Vedic sages uh, uh, who mentions that are also the sages of an epic, which is Ramayana. They're there in the epic, they're also there in the Vedas. You know, like Vishwamitra, Vashishta, Bamdeva. And Vishwamitra is one of the patron sages of the city. Whether he existed or not, that's not so important. But he left a legacy of a combination of human thoughts, which runs through the whole course of human history, even today, which is combining the softer with the harder, combining the analytical with the intuitive and the creative. And that's what Varanasi is all about. Nothing more, nothing less. It vibrates. And how it vibrates? It's music. Varanasi is a city of vibration, of harmony, of the music that we see and hear externally and that we feel and imbibe internally. The harmony between the two worlds, which helps us emerge as a better human being. And that's what Varanasi is all about. I remember about five years back, Professor Rajiv Sangal, the then director of IIT BHU, just told me there is a person who has written a few lines on Varanasi. His name is Sanjeev Sanyal. And that's how I came to know Sanjeev, uh, who has said, you don't go and change Varanasi. Varanasi changes you. Hmm. You know, you have not. Because the problems that we have done to Varanasi is by us. So we, 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 we diminish the problems in us. We diminish the pollution. We diminish the increasing vehicularization of the roads. We diminish our tendencies to move with motorbikes in those quiet pacific lanes where we have contemplation as Rakiti was talking about. We diminish our propensity to convert that whole city of peace and exchange into a full business center, which is just one of the dimension, but not the only dimension of the city. So we change and Varanasi remains what it is. And, uh, Obhijit will agree. He's the, he's the person, Professor Obhijit Mukherjee, which Sanjeev was referring uh, to his work, wonderful work, which has even caught the attentions of, uh, and he's working on the geoarchaeology of Hawaii in association with the, with the British Geological Survey. Dr. Martin Smith was supposed to be here, but he's just gone to another place because of a, a different work. He's doing excellent work on the geomorphology and the geoarchaeology of Hawaii itself. 
So harmony, music, that's what it is all about. And Varanasi <coughs> has given us the window, the aperture, you know, the chaita window, the bay window, through which we have a focus inside the chaita hall, where we see the columns, which are the reeds of music, you know, the wind pipes of a piano, or maybe the, the standing columns of a xylophone, or maybe the rhythms and the harmonies in scales and progression, what we call Pythagorean mode in Western music, and the ragas and the sutis in Eastern music. And we all know somewhere around 1800 BC, around 16 Indian ragas were exactly reflecting the Western modes, like the Median mode, the Dorian mode, the Arabian mode, the Anatolian mode, and many others. So this is a matter of great research. So music provides us an aperture, a living art, through which we can become a better human being. And that's why we are transplanting music in the very heart of Hyatt Kalpur.